Well, I'm pleased to be with you again this year at Coptic Solidarity's 8th Annual Conference. I want to thank Dr. Gurgis and Lindsay Griffin for inviting me to speak today. And I'm very glad to share this panel with the recently elected Vice Chair of USERP, Sandra Jolly, and my former colleague, Dwight Bashir, who's the Policy Director at USERP. Religious minorities are at a critical moment. Attacks by ISIS and other terrorists, as well as repression by authoritarian regimes, threaten the existence of religious minority communities across the Middle East and around the globe. The United States is fully committed to assisting the victims of ISIS atrocities, promoting religious freedom, and protecting religious diversity and pluralism. President Trump emphasized during his visit to Saudi Arabia the need to address radicalization to violence and the harmful effects it has on minorities and others. He called on the international community to stand together, quote, against the murder of innocent Muslims, the oppression of women, the persecution of Jews, and the slaughter of Christians. Vice President Pence also made it clear that, quote, protecting and promoting religious freedom is a foreign policy priority of this administration, which is fully committed in bringing relief and comfort to believers, not only across the Middle East, but across the world. So with these statements, you see that religious freedom is vital. It's not only a human right that belongs to every individual, without exception, but its presence is one of the essential conditions for permanent peace, stability, and security. This is why we continue to urge all governments to respect freedom of religion or belief within the borders, to promote diversity, to decriminalize blasphemy and apostasy laws, and to ensure that each individual has equal rights and equal access to government services, security, and justice. It's why we support the many religious communities and civil society elements working on these issues. And it's why we work to protect the cultural heritage of ancient Christian communities and other groups in the Middle East, because it preserves our common heritage while also maintaining their connection to their ancestral homelands. We've seen that countries benefit when all of their citizens can observe their innermost beliefs, and leave, live peacefully in accordance with their conscience. New studies, like Under Caesar Sword, demonstrate how environments accommodating and protecting religious freedom are freer and safer for all faiths. Our own internal research shows countries that respect and protect religious freedom and other freedoms appear less likely to experience the development of violent extremism and terrorism. This is because perceptions of injustice and harm or perceived threats to identity, including religious identity, are among the known drivers of terrorist recruitment and radicalization to violence. A recent scholarship from the State University of New York has demonstrated how the denial of religious freedom increases the likelihood of violent religious forms of political engagement, while they've also found that the best way to combat religious extremism is not by restricting religious practices, but rather by safeguarding their legitimate manifestations. But despite this good research, the challenges continue to grow. Government repression endures, with actions targeting Christians and members of other religious communities, including the jailing of pastors and the targeting of Baha'is for mistreatment in Iran, the prosecuting of members of minority groups for blasphemy in Egypt, discriminatory actions against Ahmadis in Pakistan and Algeria, and enforcing limitations on the right of freedom of religion in Saudi Arabia. But it's not only governments who persecute. We see persistent attacks on Christians and members of other religious minority groups coming from a variety of non-state actors. Recent examples of Christian populations being targeted include in Kamishli in northern Syria, in Al Khan, the Bekaa Valley of Lebanon, in Sinai, in the Egyptian heartland, Cairo, Alexandria, Tanta, Minya, and of course, ISIS's atrocities across Iraq. But we must remember that other communities also suffer at the hands of violent extremists. ISIS has attacked Yazidis, Sunnis, Turkmen Shia, Shabak, and Kakai in northern Iraq. And of course, we remember the sexual slavery of Yazidi women and girls. The disappearance of the Sabian Mendeans from Iraq almost entirely. And ISIS has targeted Shia for just being Shia, and has also struck out at any Sunni brave enough to denounce its hateful ideology, including Sunni religious leaders. The fight against ISIS is difficult, and it is not over. However, 
We're happy to see that large parts of Nineveh province and much of Mosul have been liberated due to the efforts and sacrifices of Iraqi security forces with the support of the Defeat ISIS coalition. Now the international community needs to shift from the difficult work of prosecuting a military fight to the equally difficult task of winning the peace. But this violence isn't limited to Iraq, as Egypt has also been attacked by terrorists, with militants targeting government forces, cops, and Sufi Muslims. But the particular targeting of Egypt's Christians is evidenced by the repeated choice of Coptic targets in December, in February, in April, in May, as well as by the magnitude of those attacks. Not only did ISIS declare not only did ISIS issue a declaration targeting cops that said Christians are their, quote, favorite prey. Such attacks include the December 11 attack next to the Coptic Orthodox Cathedral, where 24 died. In March, the attacks on Christians in, northern si in the northern Sinai, which resulted in seven murdered and hundreds slain. The Palm Sunday attacks on a church in Tanta and the Alexandria Coptic Cathedral, where His Holiness Pope Tiberius II was presiding, 45 were killed. And in the latest barbaric attack, a silence attacked buses of cops in Ninja who were heading to the monastery of St. Samuel the Confessor for a time of retreat and prayer. But it tragically turned into a time of death and mourning, with 28 being killed, including 10 children. As the Tahrir Institute recently reported, terrorists have rapidly and violently increased their targeting of Coptic Christians, with a total of 90 Christians killed in sectarian attacks as of May of this year, as compared to 37 in all of 2016. Yet, true to the spirit of the Church of the Martyrs, the cops have remarkably responded by praying for the perpetrators of these evil acts. Now, there are other religious freedom issues in Egypt as well. At year's end, the Egyptian government finished rebuilding the Churches destroyed or damaged in 2013 and did so at its own expense. We also welcomed the ratification of the church construction law in October 2016, which eases restrictions on the building of new churches and provides a means for registering churches built without permits over the last decades. The various denominations are to submit their list by September to a board constituted of ministers from many different parts of the Egyptian government. We are encouraged that the law stipulates that churches are allowed to continue to service their congregations while their approval is pending. We equally would like to see new churches obtaining the necessary permits in an expeditious manner. Successful implementation of the church construction law is critical as it will tangibly demonstrate to cops that they are equal citizens. And successful implementation of the law will send a message to intolerant strains in Egypt and around the region that Christians must be treated equally. And in my opinion, the greatest example of true equality is equality before the law and equal defense of rights. And this brings us to the topic of accountability for perpetrators of community-based sectarian violence. In Egypt, those perpetrators of sectarian violence who are not connected with terrorist groups are rarely held accountable. There are some exceptions, such as the murderer who killed an Alexandrian shop owner for selling alcohol, but that's an exception. One troubling case I raised last year is the case of Suad David, a case we continue to follow very closely. As perhaps everyone knows, she is a Coptic woman who was stripped and printed naked by a large mob following accusations that her son was in a relationship with a Muslim woman. Although eyewitnesses identified her assailants, we were shocked charges were dropped against them. Now we understand that the case has been reopened and 20 men face charges including assault. And President Sisi has promised accountability for the crime and the crimes associated against others who had their property, homes, property such as homes burned and looted. The United States urges the Egyptian government to ensure that the perpetrators of these vile acts are arrested, tried, and sentenced. In our view, only by bringing all perpetrators of violence to justice through the courts and no longer substituting with reconciliation sessions will cops and other communities feel safe, secure, and equal in their country. A 
couple of other religious freedom concerns are the banning of specific religious communities like the Baha'is and the Jehovah's Witnesses, as well as their Egypt's blasphemy law. In 2016, charges of, quote, denigration of religion by private individuals led to the prosecutions of Muslim reformers, a group of Christian children, an individual for Twitter use, an atheist, and a Salafi television preacher. Eight individuals were convicted. Such laws have a chilling societal effect on individual freedom of expression, and thought, conscience, and religion. The United States opposes these laws full stop. And from what I've observed from over almost 20 years in this field, the enforcements of these limitations do not promote tolerance, but these limitations on thought actually empower a violent extremist to use the mechanisms of the state to enforce their intolerant views. In Pakistan, I think is a great case in point. But as I said earlier, the fight against violent extremism is not over. While ISIS's days in Iraq are ending soon, we are entering a new phase in this fight. The counter-ISIS effort is already global, one that is playing out in homes and families and in the hearts of individuals around the world, whether it is in South or Southeast Asia, Africa, the Western Balkans, Iraq, Syria, or Egypt. We grieve for Malawi and the victims of conflict there as we do for those in the United Kingdom, France, and Egypt, and beyond. Secretary Tillerson recently, recently said, quote, as we combine efforts to defeat the military, financial, and ideological support of terrorists, we expect to see progress in the Arab world towards greater political expression, an important pathway to attack Islamic extremism and to prevent political activism from escalating into violence, he said, is to allow marginalized voices opportunity for political expression. Now, some countries argue that control is the answer, that a free society can spiral into danger. Others posit that liberties place extremist forces outside the bounds of government observation and control, that too much freedom makes a society weak, more vulnerable to this threat. But terrorists don't need freedom of speech or assembly to exploit repressive policies, to build a narrative of grievance, or to recruit. Consequently, we remain concerned about the human rights situation in Egypt. We support Egypt's efforts to confront terrorism, but believe strongly that to be effective, an indispensable part of those efforts must include protecting free expression, supporting free participation in the political process, and treating citizens equally, irregardless of faith. This also includes protecting space for civil society, which plays a vital role in providing services and holding government accountable. The recently enacted law restricting the activities of non-government organizations will jeopardize Egypt's, the ability of Egypt's active and productive civil society to meet the many challenges facing that country. In closing, for sure, Egypt faces a difficult terrorism threat that targets all Egyptians, including minorities. And we have seen how minorities, religious minorities, have been targeted for specific acts of violence around the world. Uh, based on some research my office recently did, reviewing the annual reports on international religious freedom and the, and the terrorism database, they looked for ISIS attacks against minorities. And we found between June 2014 and December 2016, over 100 cases in every, almost every corner of the world. So consequently, protection of vulnerable populations, including religious and ethnic minorities, is critical in our efforts to defeat ISIS. And it must happen before shots are fired or bombs are detonated. We must also encourage those in power to write fair laws and see them enforced, to speak out when hate-filled language calls for violence, and to practice empathy when community members are dehumanized and marginalized. The global defeat of ISIS and whatever groups may inherit its criminal violence and hatred must be built on a foundation of justice and accountability, respect for persons of faith, differing political persuasion, good and inclusive governance and reconciliation. To ensure a durable and lasting peace, we must support the principles of democracy, inclusive and impartial governance, and human rights for all individuals, including women and girls, and in particular, religious minorities.